Welcome to Exponential Talks. Today we have an awesome guest, Rohan Roberts. He's an astronomer, he's a scientist, he's a learner, he's a burner. Uh, he is a, an amazing uh, personality, he's a maverick, he is fresh, new thinker. He also has a boring job. <laughs> he is the head of future learning at GEMS and uh, a funky job as an entrepreneur where he is one of the co-founders of O Academy. We're going to be talking about all of this stuff and we're going to take you into the future. We're going to take you into the cosmic world and uh, basically have a lot of fun. Rahan, welcome. Great to be here, Tarek. Wonderful. Good, good to see you. Good to see you, man. You know, uh, right from the very first time I met you, I, I thought to myself, uh, you, you're living an authentic self. Tell me what has been your life's journey to get to this point where you can be yourself. Right. Um, so um, I was born and raised in Dubai. You know, I was here since 1977. And uh, I wish I could give some credit to uh, the, 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 ed the education I had. But um, uh, the education I had was very conventional, very dry, very uninspiring. And so I, I can honestly say for the first 20 years of my life, I was... Um, uh, lost, confused. I had no idea that I was able to do anything. I was just run of the mill, just going with the herd, um, and um, uh, completely shy and introverted. And um, and that's where I was until I went to university in in Leeds in in, in the UK, and I did my masters in in literature. And uh, it was a whole new world. I was exposed to an international crowd of students, and uh, that. That's when I started to figure things out, and uh, I came back and entered uh, the field of, of uh, education. So I love to travel. I've been to 73 countries now, and I had that wanderlust. I was curious about the world we live in. I wanted to experience things, try different cuisines, learn about cultures. And so Madagascar was next on the cards, and uh, I was there in the middle of the rainforest, searching for lemurs. Uh, lost to the world, really disconnected, no internet, no telephones. Mm -hmm. And I was reading this book by David Deutsch, it's called The Beginning of Infinity. Mm -hmm. And it was such a mind expansive, mind expanding book. Uh, and I realized that um, we live in an incredible universe mm -hmm. and it's so wonderful to be alive and to be self-aware and to be conscious. And uh, as an educator, I wanted to share that uh, excitement about life with uh, with my students and so a lot of the authenticity uh, that, that you mentioned uh, comes from uh, the fact that I know life is precious in the universe yeah. and life is short and you only have a few decades on this planet uh, might as well live an authentic life <laughs> would you encourage other young people to go through that same type of journey in terms of reading literature at university, traveling all over the world, being curious, being a poet, being a writer, before you actually settle down and do a job. Is right. that a kind of advice you would give to people? I would absolutely give it to young people. I think we put way too much pressure on 16-year-olds to have figured things out at such a young age. Uh, this system is wrong. Uh, it causes a lot of stress on young people. Um, and uh, they're forced to commit at such a young age and then society and their parents put so much pressure on them for them not to change. This age between 16 and 25, uh, that's when your, your, your brain and your personality is changing the most. I think during that phase, what you want is to take a multidisciplinary approach to learning. Uh, learn about as many new things as you can uh, while your personality is developing. And then decide what you want to do in life. The advice I would give a lot of young people is um, uh, try different things, try new things, and above all, travel, experience the world. You know, when I think about universities uh, and I speak to professors and provosts and so on, uh, they often say that university is about preparing you for a job. Would you agree with that? For me, university is preparing you for life, not for a job. How, what, are, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think university should also prepare you for life um, because the kinds of questions that help you uh, find meaning and purpose in life, where else are you going to find it? Um, uh, if, you are, if you have these conversations with uh, university professors or even high school teachers uh, about how do I find meaning and purpose in life, um, many of them would say, uh, you've got to figure that out for yourself or ask your parents or ask your priests. 
Uh, but often, for the most part, we don't get those answers from uh, from 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 our, from our parents and from 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 the rest of society. So universities should be institutions where you're allowed to figure things out and where you're allowed to find meaning and purpose, and where your professors are not just imparters of information, but your mentors and guides, and uh, and give you that philosophical existential perspective on life. How can we nurture more curiosity? How can we train people in the art of questioning? Uh, and constantly questioning and asking you know, repeated questions and let, let's not get out of the habit of questioning. What are your thoughts on that? Oh yeah, that's a great question. And, and the fact is, you know, we all know kids are naturally curious. They're constantly asking questions. And often parents and adults don't have the answers. Yeah. And so it's embarrassing for them. And, and so they shut, shut the kids down. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and parents are busy. We all live such hectic lives. And so the child is taught not to ask questions. And then we have a school system where, if you think about it, schools teach us to conform. School, schools teach us uh, not to rock the boat, maintain the status quo, uh, be the teacher's pet. Um, and, uh, and if you follow all the rules and obey all the instructions, you'll get a good grade and then you can leave um, a high school environment. So what we're taught in schools is conformity. And creativity is the opposite of, uh, of, of conformity and uniformity. Don't, I had never been trained how to fail. And when I failed for the very first time in my accountancy exams, I absolutely imploded because I'd never failed in anything in my life. I was never trained to. Uh, what are your thoughts on failure as a learning experience and how do you impart that in your day-to-day -day work? Right. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have anything ter terribly profound to say on the subject except um, to explain to children that it's okay when you're young, it's okay to make mistakes, and when you're older, it's okay to make mistakes. We are not perfect, and we don't live in a perfect world. So don't be so hard on yourself. Uh, it, it, it's completely fine to make mistakes, but the important thing is to learn from your mistakes and not repeat them. And, um, uh, and really go easy on yourself, be kind to yourself. So why don't we take it to the next level? Why don't we say, uh, I'll reward you for making mistakes. Sure. Um, so I will be measuring and giving you marks on the number of experiments that you do that you have not succeeded at. And then uh, I'll give you a mark on your learning from that. Right. Why yeah. don't we just reverse that? Sure, that's a great idea. And, uh, as, as, uh, as some of that exists even in uh, Silicon Valley where there's that saying, uh, fail often, fail fast. Yeah. And there's this kind of braggadocio, uh, uh, braggadocio in, in Silicon Valley where if you haven't failed X number of times, then you aren't really an entrepreneur. Absolutely. <laughs> I actually have uh, something fun. I, I call it the, the five F's of failure, which is fail fast, fail frequently, fail frugally, failure is not fatal, and always fail forward. And I have a bonus sixth F, <laughs> which is failure is a good F word. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we can keep using it. I was at, uh, just to share a story with you, uh, doing, uh, teaching a class uh, for Harvard Business School's executive program. And they asked me how long should a CV, a resume mm -hmm. be? And the consensus was uh, one page. And I said, no, two pages. And they said, what, two pages? That's too long. I said, no, all of you are really brilliant. So this is your success CV. Uh, on this side is your failure CV. What did you screw up at? What kind of mistakes did you make? What did you learn? <laughs> Can you go back to your school and say, okay, folks, write a failure CV. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what would your institution say to something like that? Oh, well, um, um, it's uh, hard to know where to begin. Um, I mean, you'd have to change a lot of mindsets. The problem is, though, um, because we, uh, we blacklist failure to such a degree uh, that people feel compelled to pretend to have the answers even when they don't and yeah. mask their failures yeah. uh, and put other people down. And so you see that culture spread not just in a school setting but at the corporate level as well. Uh, one of the things that you spoke about earlier as, as the head of innovation of, of a, a more traditional... He head uh, of future uh, learning. Head of future <laughs> learning, a bigger part. <laughs> head of future learning of, a, uh, 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 of GEMS. Uh, what kind of future learning curriculum do you have there and, and how expansive is it? Right, so uh, one of the things that really excites me about what we're doing at <laughs> GEMS is we co-created a curriculum with Singularity University, uh, which is based in Silicon uh, Valley. And it's called the Global Futures Curriculum. And essentially, it takes an interdisciplinary approach to learning. It's a combination of science and technology, uh, art and design, business and entrepreneurship. And it gives students the uh, thinking toolkits they need and the uh, mindsets they need to survive and thrive in a world of exponential change and uh, um, uh, dramatic innovations. 
And the student response to it has been exhilarating. They absolutely love it because they see how relevant it is. Mm. And one of the important focuses of the curriculum is the impact of exponential technology. Yeah. So we're seeing um, uh, a coming together of AI, uh, genetics, nanotechnology, robotics, quantum computing, and it's disrupting all aspects of society and uh, education as well. Mm. And so um, the old paradigm of getting straight A's at high school, going off to do a bachelor's, then a master's, then a PhD, and a job for life, mm -hmm. that paradigm is over. And we would be doing a disservice to our students if we kept insisting on that, on that paradigm. Great. Let's talk about intelligences, because the, we have multiple intelligence. We have spatial intelligence, essential intelligence, spiritual intelligence, physical intelligence. We are sort of getting numbed to those intelligences. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on intelligence and intelligences, and how do those multiple intelligences come together in your life. Sure. Yeah, so this is something I speak about often and I, I have thought about deeply and um, I have a lot to say on it, so the, uh, the trick is to condense it. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, but as an educator, uh, my definition of intelligence is the ability uh, to solve problems and create products of value in society. Okay. So uh, uh, that's my working definition of, of intelligence. And we all have all the intelligences. There's verbal intelligence, log logical intelligence, uh, spatial intelligence, uh, kinesthetic intelligence, and so on, existential. There's uh, eight different types of intelligences that work together in complex ways. And it's important for us uh, in a school to cater to all the intelligences uh, 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 that, uh, uh, that we find in a classroom among, among students. How are we educating um, the HR managers? How are we educating the employers in terms of being able to observe these intelligences and what sort of things are you doing towards that, if any? Right. So or, at, or what sort of things should we be all, all collectively be doing? Right, yeah. Well, at the moment, the emphasis is really on, on the students and on, 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 on the educators. Uh, yes, there is a huge role to be played by, uh, by HR and the corporate world as well. But right now, we, you know, with the limited bandwidth we have, mm -hmm. uh, our focus um, is specifically on catering to students and, and, and educating the educators. Yeah. <laughs> so and parents as well, you know, yeah. because parents still think in a traditional way. Yeah. They still think maths, English, science, engineering. <laughs> yeah. uh, but what they don't realize is in this world of uh, uh, accelerating change in exponential technologies yeah. and this uh, 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 imagination age that we're seeing, people who are creative are going to be the money makers in, 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 in the coming future because the, uh, the machines will be doing a lot of stuff that uh, we thought traditionally only humans could do. But now if you think about uh, YouTube, if you think about the VR industry, uh, if you think about the gaming industry, uh, these are now go are set to be trillion dollar industries and you need content. Who's going to create the, all that content? You need the graphic designers, you need the artists, you need the musicians. And these are going to be the, uh, the, uh, the, the new uh, producers of value in the coming economy. Nice little segue into AI. Um, I think it's a uh, it's a disservice to AI to call it artificial intelligence. Uh, to me, it's augmented intelligence uh, and how we can augment ourselves with this intelligence. Firstly, what are your thoughts on AI? And then we'll evolve it into where it's going. Right. So uh, uh, Thomas Friedman, who's the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, uh, yes. po points out um, that whatever can be uh, outsourced and automated will be outsourced and automated. To this, Kevin Kelly, who's the founder of Wired magazine, says, um, uh, uh, whatever can be done by AI will be done by AI. Now, there's a lot of complacency among uh, the, 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 the layperson or the general audience or the general public. Um, but what people don't realize is we now have AI doing things that we thought only humans could do. Mm -hmm. In the past, we thought only humans could make art, only humans could uh, create music, only humans could drive cars. We now have AI in 2020 making art, um, uh, creating music, driving cars, yeah. and pretty soon AI will do a lot of the uh, creative things that humans are doing. I mean, we have AI writing poetry right now, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, there's AI writing news reports. So the big question we need to ask ourselves is, what is the purpose of education in a world where AI is doing the things we thought were once unique to humans? And then we need to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of us humans in a world where AI is doing all the things we thought were once unique to humans? So these are big, profound, existential questions that uh, there is no easy answer to, but what we should be doing is having conversations about this. You're a scientist. Do you want to slow down the science of the development of AI and what are the ethics of doing it and the ethics of not doing it? Right. 
Uh, so speaking for myself, I would like to see us go a little slow uh, on this front and show a little, uh, be a little more circumspect uh, uh, because uh, these are really powerful technologies and we're just forging ahead with, with, with no thought. We're careening into the future uh, without reflecting, without introspecting. Uh, but that's what I personally would like. But what I want or don't want is meaningless because we live in a world where this is going to happen, whether we like it or not. Yeah. So there are these unintended questions. So you know, if you are a responsible educator, responsible scientist, and, and, and so on, isn't that an integral part of your, I wouldn't say duty, but as, as your personal passion to see us stay on the right path? Uh, the first and most important thing is to raise awareness and change mindsets. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're not necessarily going to convince everyone, but at the very least, the most basic thing we need to do as educators is uh, raise awareness. Uh, about about these technologies, about uh, the ethical implications of, uh, of AI. Yeah. A lot of innovation comes from uh, organizations and entrepreneurs who are sort of unleashed out there, uh, in which case there can be a lot of unintended consequences also. Uh, if capital and profit is the core driver uh, for future technology development, AI development and so on, how much money you can make, how much control and dominance you can have. Uh, are we just going, finding a, a very difficult place for ourselves? Because, and should it be more social, socially driven rather than more profit driven? Right, yeah, absolutely. I think we need a balance, balance and harmony and everything. And that's why one of the things we focus on with uh, OI Academy is to teach students uh, new perspectives and ensure that we don't make the same mistakes going into the 21st century that we did in the 20th century. And so one of our core areas of focus uh, is uh, taking a cosmic perspective, zooming out, seeing the big picture, and behaving not just like global citizens, but like cosmic citizens, because our destiny is out there in the stars. We are destined to explore space. And we cannot continue with the same mindsets and, the, and making the same mistakes that we did in the 20th century that led to so much social inequality, so much disconnection between us and our environment, and uh, so much social injustice, you know? Uh, so um, the important thing is uh, to uh, ch uh, uh, raise a new generation of young people who will have different values, uh, who will have more compassion and more connection with uh, their fellow human beings. And we, as uh, the older generation, may not have all the answers, but we've got to give the freedom to these children to express themselves and experiment and explore and voice their, their ideas and create opportunities for them to do so. So when you put your telescope on um, in the year 2030, who do you think will be the leaders in AI? Because I was reading a report today which stated that uh, uh, whoever's leading in AI in 2030 will lead the world for the next century. Right. Who do you think would be the leaders? Uh, well, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, right now, uh, I know Google is, is, is heavily funding research in, in, in the field of AI for the, for the past few years. Uh, Ray Kurzweil uh, was director of engineering at at, um, uh, 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 at Google. I'm not sure if he still is, uh, but uh, if anyone could bring about the AI revolution single-handedly, it's Ray Kurzweil, who is who's been described as a modern-day Thomas Alva Edison because of the sheer number of patents to his name and the sheer number of inventions. Um, and what he points out is, in the next hundred years. Uh, we will see the equivalent of 20,000 years worth of progress. Right. And so that's something our, uh, the, uh, the, gen the average person can't wrap their minds around, you yeah. know. And if you think about where we were 20,000 years ago, we've come a long way in 20,000 years. Yeah, yeah so uh, staying with Raker as well, I mean, that's uh, looking at from a corporate world. But what about countries? I mean, uh, innovation is still coming from the U.S., but the execution of AI is coming in out of China. Also, when it gets into that world, uh, smaller countries can take over. Sure. Um, and uh, so there's going to be a, a new geography, a new balance coming through over the next 10 years or so. Sure, what, yeah. I, what is your thesis on that? Yeah, so if you think about it, you know, why a lot of these innovative mm -hmm. companies, these billion, trillion dollar in, uh, companies coming out of Silicon Valley? Uh, one is there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's a great deal of uh, venture capital, mm -hmm. but more importantly, there's protection of IP. Uh, and that's hugely important. And uh, is it important in this world of open source and, and, and so on? Uh, uh, yes and no. Uh, Again, yes yeah. and yes and no. But uh, uh, I I if you feel uh, you you as an entrepreneur or as a, 
uh, uh, young um, person entering the workforce, if you feel your ideas will be taken and there's no protection for it, would you be more inclined to set up your business in a country like China? Or would you be more interested to set it up in a, a country that you know will protect your, 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 uh, your IP? And I'm willing to bet most people will want to uh, uh, protect their ideas, you know, and... Um, uh, Is it, aren't ideas about sharing? It's uh, 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 like w one of my, my professors, uh, Professor Marshall Goldsmith, he's got Buddhist teachings and he said, you know, I'm a medium and I want to give absolutely. and I want to share. So whatever ideas I've got is actually out there. Absolutely. So why can't we have that holistic view I, of the and world? I, oh, I, I completely agree with you. I, you know, I just uh, published a book on, on Zen. And so uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I completely believe in, 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 in sharing. Uh, but uh, when it comes to uh, the entrepreneurial field, um, and if you're setting up a, a for-profit uh, yeah. company, yeah. That's, it's a different ballgame. Uh, it's the same with music, it's the same with art. You yeah. can share it, but at the same time, you want um, uh, acknowledgement for what is yours, and you wouldn't want to see someone s uh, take it without uh, giving you anything in return. Talking about your passions, I know that one of the things you love is Burning Man, and Africa is burning. I mean, I, you, can you share your sort of experience about it and, and inspire us because sure. I haven't been should I yeah I, yeah well I, I, the sh uh, short answer is yes I think everyone <laughs> on this planet should experience Burning Man at least once um, and well, uh, my elevator pitch for people uh, uh, when I talk to them about Burning Man is this I've been to 73 countries I love to travel I would trade all those 73 countries for one experience at Burning Man so in other words if you gave me a ticket with 73 countries that I can visit or you gave me a ticket to Burning Man I would take Burning Man in a heartbeat any really? day of the week. Really? So my vision of Burning Man is you get high, uh, you run around naked, and you don't know what the hell happened, and you come back with a new sort of discovery. Right. Is that what it is? Yeah, yes and no. <laughs> 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 my answer to everything these days is yes and <laughs> yes no. Yes and no, exactly. So you're not committing, you're sitting on a fence. Uh, no, but uh, the honest fact is, uh, when you see pictures of Burning Man, it looks like any old music festival. Uh, it looks like Coachella or Glastonbury or uh, Shambhala or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but what makes Burning Man different is, oh, the best way to describe Burning Man is it's an experiment in community living. Uh, it's, if you want, you can call it an arts festival. But what makes Burning Man special is the principles it is based on. It's based on a gifting economy. There is no advertising, no exchange of money. Uh, there's other principles like uh, uh, radical self-expression uh, and, and, and such. And so what makes Burning Man special is it's the one place where you're free to be who you are. Um, and um, I, I, often I'm, I'm, I'm lost for words because you have to go there to know there, as, yeah. as Jamie Wheel says, because yeah. hearing uh, someone else talk about these experiences is one thing, but actually going there and experiencing for yourself is something else. You are a great evangelist. Well done. <laughs> now, w one of the things I was thinking of uh, as a completely separate discussion uh, is when you talk, spoke about gifting and sharing, um, is looking at a new business and working model of universal basic income. And, uh, and I started this discussion about two years ago, and now it's sort of almost a mainstream discussion because of Andrew Yang and various other people. Uh, is universal basic income a, an interesting way to look at future models? Sure, I mean, um, look, I, I don't think we'll have a, an absolute yes or no on this until we actually try it. Uh, it sounds interesting in, in, in theory and, you know, the, uh, the compassionate person in me uh, feels like this is the right way to go, mm -hmm. but I'm not an economist, so I can't have a strong opinion on this. Uh, I like the idea of everyone getting a basic income just so that they can survive and then uh, no one has to starve. And one way, as they say, of doing it is to uh, tax companies that use AI. Uh, and, and use that uh, tax income to uh, fund a universal basic income program. Indeed, I mean, one of the things that happens cognitively, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking in front of neuroscientists, so you know, forgive me if I am being too simplistic, but the part of the brain that's involved in survival, if that is reduced in terms of its intensity and its usage, then it opens up for sure. creativity yeah. and entrepreneurship and new learning. And even at a very simplistic level, if that can be done, perhaps we can unearth many new things. Absolutely, and uh, that's why I think Burning Man is an example of a post-AI uh, post AI world and a world uh, that's post-automation. Because if we wonder what will people do when the machines uh, do all the jobs for us, uh, either a lot of people will get drunk down in the pub or they will be busy creating, yep. busy having fun, busy 
being whimsical, busy playing. You know, as human beings, we don't, as adults especially, we don't spend too much time playing. And what you see at Burning Man is a lot of play, is a lot of creativity, because a lot of the artists at Burning Man, not all of them, but many of them, have a disposable income. They're not worried about where their next meal will come from. Right. They're not worried about falling ill. And so a lot of the entrepreneurs from Silicon Valley go there, a lot of people from MIT and Harvard go. Uh, uh, there's a huge uh, crowd from San Francisco. Uh, and uh, definitely not everyone at Burning Man is well off, but a, a sizable percentage is. And these are people who have taken care of their uh, b basic needs mm -hmm. and can now flourish uh, artistically and creatively. Well, I'd like to get to a stage where we uh, you know, fire some quick questions at you to give your sort of instinctive in, uh, responses. Uh, what are you most passionate about in life? Uh, I really am most passionate about education um, and uh, sharing uh, a, a cosmic perspective with the people around me. Do you have a hero in life uh, that you look up to or you feel that that is somebody who's really going to make a difference? I, I have uh, lots of people who've influenced my thinking, but uh, currently I'd have to say the philosopher Alan Watts, uh, mainly because uh, he gives you a fusion between the East and West. Is there a book that you would recommend uh, us to read if there was one book or one thing, apart from your own, right. <laughs> we'll read yeah. yours, yeah. <laughs> uh, but is there one book that you would expect, want us to read? I, I would suggest uh, The Beginning of Infinity, uh, Explanations That Transform the World by David Deutsch. He's a quantum physicist at Oxford. Uh, what keeps you up at night? What do you worry about most? To be honest, I sleep like a baby. Not <laughs> very, very little keeps me up at night. Uh, but of course, I'm you know, concerned about all the grand challenges facing our species. But I suppose I sleep well because I'm optimistic. <laughs> Actually, you know, I say that entrepreneurs like myself sleep like a baby, which means we fall asleep, then we wake up, <laughs> and then we cry, and then we fall asleep right. again, and then we have to go <laughs> and have enough. something to so we eat. Should, <laughs> so we should change that idiom. <laughs> yes, exactly. So sleeping like a baby is like doesn't work. Yeah. But anyway, I, I know what you mean. But thank you for that. Um, your 80th birthday, now let's go further, your 100th birthday. We're here to celebrate your 100th birthday. What are we celebrating? What, what are the wonderful things you, at this stage in your life, you want to, to have achieved by then? Right, um, oh, that's a tricky question. Uh, um, I think uh, it, most important is the relationships I've had uh, and, and, and the fact that uh, I've lived a full life. I think that would be important, uh, that I've uh, ex lived life to the least, you know, as the saying goes, and, um, and have, uh, have uh, friends and, and family around me who, uh, who acknowledge that uh, maybe I didn't accomplish everything I set out to do, but uh, I lived a good life. And that's really what uh, would matter to me. So what is that human emotion that focuses our life towards material stuff. But when we think about things that are really meaningful, uh, it's non-financial and non-material stuff. Is the, uh, where does that value system come back to us? Well, I think the reason for that is because we live in a society where uh, we are taught that this is what is m meaningful and impactful. Uh, but it takes us a lifetime to unlearn uh, that uh, uh, material success does not guarantee happiness. And I, th I think the older one gets, the, the more obvious that becomes. Uh, Rohan, is there anything that I may have missed that you would like to share with us? Um, any thoughts, any ideas? Uh, uh, can I mention my book? <laughs> please, 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 absolutely. So I spent the last uh, couple of years writing uh, my book, uh, Cosmic Citizens and Moonshot Thinking, mm -hmm. Education in an Exponential Age. And essentially, it looks at the impact of exponential technologies, how we've got to change, how we educate our kids, and zooming out and seeing the big picture. Okay, super. Ron, thank you very much indeed. It's Great. a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Tariq. And Tarek. you've been very <laughs> generous with your time.